Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where today we're going to be checking out something hard for the Amiga. The hard drive enclosure, A500 HD+. Or to give it its full name, the Impact Series 2 A500 HD+, which was later rebranded as the Impact Series 2 A500 HD 8 Plus. Now this is a hard drive enclosure made by GVP, also known as Great Valley Products, and was released in 1991. Now I have here most of what would have been in the box at the time, which includes the hardware itself, a power supply and an install floppy disk, which to be honest are the three most important parts. The plan for the video is to set it up, install Workbench and then get some games on it, as we have to stick with the channel branding after all. And while we're at it, we'll also take a look at the hardware in more detail and see what's inside. Now you might have guessed from its looks, it was designed to be used with the 500 and A500 Plus. Now I'm going to be using my childhood A500 Plus, and it just connects via the side expansion slot. Now I have to say, it does look quite stylish when connected. It really does follow the design nicely. The power connector goes into the back of the unit, and with that, it's ready to go. Now I tend to turn the drive on first, so it can spin up before turning on the Amiga. Though the instruction manual hints that this isn't really needed, and you should just turn both of them on at the same time. Though before we turn on the Amiga, I'd better insert the installation disc, as we need to boot from it. And yes, that noise you can hear is the fan and the hard drive that's inside of this device. It's not what you'd call quiet. With Workbench booted, we can start setting up the drive, which you might notice has actually already been set up, but there's nothing on it that I really care about, so let's show off the program and the process in getting it ready. The main application we're going to be using is Fast Prep, as it handles all the preparation for the drive, and when we launch, it gives us two main options, Manual and Automatic. Manual, as you might have guessed, allows you to set up all the parameters by hand, and it also allows you to set up the partitions. But I think I'm going to skip this and use the automatic option, as I'd rather not screw anything up, and I don't really need partitions. And when we select this, it'll give us a few prompts, warning us that we've already set up the drive, but it allows us to continue and set up the drive as fresh. This is actually a 52 megabyte drive, which shows up as 49 megabytes of usable space, which is the equivalent of over 50 Amiga formatted floppy disks which between the drive and the rest of the hardware would have cost between four to five hundred pounds at the time. And after getting it to format the drive, we now have the option of copying an OS to the drive. Now I actually have a few choices here. We have the 2.04 workbench that I actually got with the machine, as well as a number of other versions that I've collected over the years, ranging from one all the way up to three. Or I could even use the customised version that I made back in the day, Zulbench. Just look at all those redrawn icons. Mwah. Well, let's stick to what I would have used back in the day and go with the Workbench 2 discs, which actually makes using the built-in copy option quite useful, as Commodore didn't provide installation discs until their later 600 machines. So this will actually allow us to copy as many discs as we like to the drive directly. And while that copies, let's take a look at the hardware in a bit more detail. Don't worry, as I filmed this separately to the install, so we won't break anything. Around the back is the power connector, as well as a 25 pin SCSI connector. Now from the docks, it seems you could actually daisy chain seven drives to the machine. If we look on the top, we find the switch that selects between auto boot and game mode. Most of the time you can leave it on auto boot, as you can still start software from the floppy drive if it's inserted before starting the computer. But some games can get a little bit weird with the drive and its firmware, so you can turn it off with the game mode to allow those games to work, as it effectively turns the drive off while still allowing you to leave it connected. To get inside we have to flip it over and undo three screws. And with a bit of care as there's two sets of wires, the top just comes off. And as we can see the bulk of this case is filled with the drive. And if we look further down, we can see where that 8 and plus part of its name comes in, 
as you can actually fit up to 8 megabytes of fast RAM via these four SIM slots. And as some eagle eyed viewers might have noticed on Workbench, I actually have 2 megabytes of RAM fitted. There is also this pin header that runs along the side. This could actually be used to attach a PC emulation card that would have looked something like this, which had a 286 on the board and actually supported a number of the video modes. And finally, there's this fan, it's actually glued to the case, which will really make replacing it a bit of a pain to do. And with the installation complete and all the floppy disks removed from the drive, we can now reboot the machine. And after a few questions, we're very quickly in Workbench. It is so much faster than a floppy drive. And it's just sat there ready to be configured and mess around with. On a modern machine, this would be where we would install WHD load. But today, I want to keep it old school. And check out a few games that directly support being installed and run from the hard drive. And it just so happens that I have a few here. First up we have Settlers, which is a great example, as it has an installer on one of the discs. And all it really needs from us is a location for it to install to. Now I've already created a folder called Games, so let's install it to HD0, Hard Disk 0, Games, Settlers. And it will then copy all the files and ask us to change disc as needed. Once that is finished, we can find a nice customized folder, which is always nice to find. And inside we have two programs, Intro and Game, which allows us to skip the intro if we want and just go straight into the game. Now it seems even with it installed to the hard disk, we still have to pass the copy protection. But I do like how informative this screen is, as it tells us the size of the levels we can play, as well as the fact that it will save to the hard drive. Now from this point, the game pretty much plays the same as the floppy disk, just that it loads just a little bit faster, and the fact that we can save to the hard drive rather than a floppy disk, which means no need to have a save disk around, which is a very nice touch. The next game I want to install is a favourite of mine, K240, and your first challenge is to find the installer, which ends up being on disc 3. They just tended to add this to whatever disc had the most free space. Now interestingly, this actually uses the workbench installer system to handle everything. Though it does look like there's a bit of a bug in the system, as it didn't install to the selected folder, it just used it as part of the name. Now if we open up this badly named folder, we can actually find another nicely done icon to start the game. The rest of the files are actually all here, but they're hidden. Unfortunately, the game will always want to show the intro, but once the logos have showed up, you can skip it at least. and we're very quickly into the main menu. This is so much faster than playing off disk. Again, we can just save straight to the hard drive and accessing some of the other menus that would have required disk loading is just smooth as silk. While this game doesn't require a hard drive, it just feels so much nicer when you play it from it. Asteroid discovered. Welcome to SciTech.
Well, it's time to move away from simulations as we go to install Flashback. Now, unlike all the other games that we've played, this one does not come with its own dedicated installer. Instead, you have to copy the game to the drive yourself. So after making a directory, it's time to open up the shell and copy everything from the disk to that folder. The reason for this is that the shell copy command will actually merge folders. The UI on the other hand will try to replace them, which isn't great when you're trying to copy four disks of data that uses a common set of folders. Once that's done, we can actually look into the folder and uh, well, there doesn't seem to be any files, as none have been given an icon. So we have to show all and then double click the flashback file to actually start the game. Once again, we have some copy protection to deal with, and I have to say I'm not a big fan of Flashback's one, it's so tedious to look through the entire manual to find the right picture. The manual itself actually mentions that you should actually start it from the shell, using the command end run flashback, which I found you needed to do when you ran it from the 1200. But on the 500, you just seem to be able to double click on the flashback icon, and it all plays just fine. It is a bit surprising there isn't an icon or a dedicated installer, as they actually designed the game with a drive in mind, as there's an extra set of animations that will play by default when running from the hard drive. You could enable them when running from the floppy disk, but they took a while to load, and so normally it would just give you a message on the screen instead, as that was much faster. So again, this is a game that plays better when run from the hard drive, but I wouldn't say it justified the cost of the HD+. Unlike the next game, as of all my collection, this game needs to be installed the most. Beneath a Steel Sky. A 15 floppy disk epic that was an absolute pain to play from a single floppy drive. The installer is found on the boot disk, aka disk 15, and starts a custom graphic installer, which allows you to set which drive and the directory to install to, and off it goes. Now this has to be the slowest install I have ever done which includes several operating systems. As I can only assume it was doing some form of decompressing on the data as it went, as the install took well over an hour and a half. And it even had the fun of a disk read error, which meant cleaning the disk and then hoping that that would be enough to get it to continue. The game itself runs great from the drive, even if for some reason the folder was hidden but then anything would be an improvement over the disc swapping that this game had. Just changing screens was a slow load, and quite often involved changing the disc. It just made exploring the amazing world a real chore to do. Now amazingly, this is the only game that we've played so far that had no copy protection. I guess they figured the huge number of discs would have been enough. Though annoyingly, like a few of the games that we've played, it does not have an option to quit back to Workbench you just have to reboot the machine when you're done with the game. But I'm not sure why you'd want to do that anyway, because this is such a great game, and plays so much nicer from the hard drive. Transitioning from screens is quick and easy, and it's just so much nicer to play. Yeah, it's a pity there's no voice acting, but then I wouldn't have expected that on 15 floppy disks. I've mentioned a few times about the faster load time of the hard drive, but how much faster is it really? Well, I did some quick and dirty tests to find out. This involved copying a 512 kilobyte file to and from the drives 
using the RAM disk. I ran these a few times and these are the best results that I got. The floppy drive could write about 7.6 kilobytes a second and could read at 15.5 kilobytes a second and the hard drive could write about 284 kilobytes a second and read at 182.9 kilobytes a second. Which roughly means the hard drive was 37 times faster at writing and 11 times faster at reading, which I think we can all agree is quite dramatic. Unfortunately, only a small percentage of the Amiga library could be played from a hard disk, which is where WHD load has come into its own but it's still fun to go back to some of the classics and see how they would have been played. And if you can handle the copy protection, some of the games are actually a lot better when played from a real install, as it doesn't have to try and simulate a disk drive. There are a few upgrades that would be quite cool to do, like adding more RAM, replacing the fan, or even getting one of those SD to SCSI devices. But even without all that, it's still an amazing bit of kit to have. If I had this in the 90s, it would have blown my mind, as some of my favourite games actually had options to install straight to it. Instead, I was stuck with just a single floppy drive. But if you were lucky enough to have one, I'd love to hear about it. And until next time, I was the Goldfish, that was 52 megabytes of hard action, and this was Goldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my video, I do hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, you can let me know down in the comments, or you can use those buttons just below. You know the ones I mean. Or if you're not sure yet, then you can check out two other videos that I've done that are on the screen right now. So thank you again, and I hope to see you soon.